I have not been in front of a crowd in two years. <laughs> when I came here from Vienna, I looked at my clicker and I was like, I haven't used this thing in two years. I should probably replace the battery. Uh, and I'm glad I did because it, it works. Uh, I'm Max. I am the co-founder of GraphCDN. And this is actually a special occasion for another reason as well, because we founded GraphCDN um, about half a year ago. And this is the first time we've flown the entire team in to meet at the same location because we're a fully remote company. Um, and so we have the entire team sitting here. Most importantly, and I want to call this out because you all should go annoy him, uh, Phil is here, who is the creator of Urkel, the best GraphQL client. Um, now, if you use uh, Urkel, you should definitely go talk to Phil. If you use Apollo, you should for sure go talk to Phil uh, because uh, you will still use it afterwards. But uh, he will convince you that it was a bad choice. <laughs> this whole story really started uh, in 2017 for me. Um, I was the co-founder of another company called Spectrum, and we were using GraphQL heavily for all of our API needs. We had a huge schema, and we were fetching all this data, um, and we were building a modern take on a community forum. In fact, Prisma, way back then, uh, ran their community forum on Spectrum, which was a huge responsibility uh, because that was a lot of people. And the problem was we were growing very quickly because people like Prisma started using us, and I had no idea what I was doing. And so we had huge scaling problems. I had chosen a very annoyingly bad database called RethinkDB. Zero out of 10 would not recommend. I'm very glad that Prisma doesn't support it because it is not a good choice. Uh, and Really, it could not keep up with our traffic. And there wasn't a lot we could do. We spent a lot of time optimizing our database queries and stuff like that. Um, but fundamentally, the database just could really not keep up. And I was thinking about how to solve this, right? Like, I was the main technical person on the team, and I was like, I've got to solve this problem, right? Like, how do I fix this? And interestingly, our use case was extremely read heavy. It's a forum, right? So, of course, people post threads. But way more people read stuff than actually write stuff. And on top of that, a lot of our data was public. Yes, we also had like direct messages and authenticated users and whatever. But 90% of our data was public, and the same for every user. So we had a very read-heavy use case with lots of public data, an ideal case for caching. right? If we could just cache our API responses, that could probably take a whole lot of traffic out of our hands and sort of keep our database a little bit less busy and on fire. And so I looked around, but there really wasn't any solution for that, right? You, nobody really done that before. People had built sort of custom internal solutions, but there wasn't really a way to make this happen. And in my head, I was like, I just want to deploy a GraphQL client to a server. Can't be that hard, right? Because GraphQL clients, if you think about it, they cache stuff on the client. And so I basically just want to do the same thing but on the server. It should be pretty much the same, right? So let's dig a little bit into how GraphQL clients cached. We heard about the uh, built-in meta fields into GraphQL earlier, and they're actually a big part of the sort of magic that make GraphQL caching work and are a big part of the reason that GraphQL clients are awesome. Because to every query and to every object type, as we heard, you can add the underscore underscore type name meta field. And that tells you what type a certain object is, which is really useful. Because if we have this get post query here, where we're loading a post, its title, and the author, and the name of the author, when we get the response, we know that this is now the post with the ID 5 and the user with the ID 1. And when we take this entire response and we put it into the cache, we can tag it and say, OK, we know this is the response for this query. And it contains the post with the ID 5. I have to look at which, which number I chose for this example, because I always forget it, uh, and the user with the ID 1. Why is that useful? Because now we can do automatic invalidation. If we pass a mutation through our API called edit post, and we say, hey, for this post with the ID 5, change the title to something else. When the response comes back and we add the type name, we know that the post with the ID 5 has changed, because we know it was a mutation. So it must have changed data. GraphQL, right? And we know, because it returned the type name and the ID, that it, the post with the ID 5 has probably changed. Now, of course, they could have set the same title again if they wanted to. But still, we can compare them and invalidate any cached query results that contain that post. And that's magical, right? That's a lot of the reason why using apps built with GraphQL feels so awesome, because all of this really doesn't take any work on your part. If you use a GraphQL client, that's just how it works, right? That's just how GraphQL works, and that's how GraphQL clients work. 
Now that's nice, but there's some edge cases where this stops working. And the main one really is list invalidation. Because if we have a query like this, where we load a list of posts, right? And we add the type name to it, and eventually back comes a list of posts. In this case, there's only one, but there could be more, right? The problem is, if we now have a mutation that's called create post, and we create a new post because we've written a new blog post, we pass a new title, whatever. When the result comes back from this mutation, it contains the post with the ID 6. But of course, the problem is we don't have the post with the ID 6 anywhere in our cache, right? So we can't actually automatically invalidate the list of cached posts because we don't know what has changed because we've literally never seen this post before. We have no idea where it is. The solution to that that GraphQL clients have is manual invalidation. And for example, with Urkel, the best GraphQL client, have I mentioned that it's awesome? Uh, this looks something like this. You can have this updates configuration where you say, OK, when a create post mutation comes in, please invalidate the query.posts, any, any cache query result that contains the query.posts field. And that way, I can sort of um, handle this edge case of creating something in a list uh, where I don't know that stuff has changed. GraphQL clients actually are a little bit more advanced than that even. Because what, what we were just talking about is document level caching, which, which really means taking the entire result that you have and putting it into the cache. But GraphQL clients are actually a little bit smarter. They do something called normalized caching. What does that mean? Well, if we go back to our old example of loading a post, right? We get the result back, we get the post and the author and whatever. Rather than storing, taking this entire thing and putting it into the cache, we actually figure, store every object individually. And so in our cache, it would look, this would look something like this. We say, OK, we have the post with the ID 5. And then that has all the data for the post with the ID 5. And then it also has the user with the ID 1. And then it has all of the data for the user with the ID 1. Now, you might be thinking, but the post has an author. Where is that author? Well, Urkel stores the relations on objects in a separate table. And so it sort of connects, OK, if we're querying the post with a slug, graphical edge caching, that is what we have in our cache as the post with the ID 5. If we're loading the post with the ID 5 and its author, the author refers to the user with the ID 1. And then the user with the ID 1 doesn't have any relations. So we don't have any links on there. And the interesting thing is that that actually, in many cases, makes for a much nicer user experience because we can sort of update objects in one place and they'll update throughout any query that we have anywhere in the cache, right? Let's say you have this post query and maybe somebody's already looked at a post and then they go back and then they click edit post. When you edit that post and it comes back and the post with the ID 5 has changed, we can update the post with the ID 5 in this one central location and any query result that contains that post will suddenly reflect the new data which is actually really nice and makes for an even nicer user experience. You'll often see this with apps that use GraphQL when you have a list of things, right? Let's say you have a list of blog posts and you click on a blog post, often they can immediately show the data for the blog post because they've already loaded it, right? Even though that's a completely separate query that only loads a single blog post, because that, that data is already in the cache, they can just show it immediately on the screen. Again, much nicer user experience. It takes a little bit of manual work because you have to connect those things together with some configuration, but it does make for a much nicer user experience. So here we are. And here I am thinking, OK, why can't I just do the same thing but on the server, right? Why can't I just deploy this to MCDM somewhere and have um, GraphQL edge cache, right? Why can't I just run Urkel at the edge and have that be served for all of my users? But that's also where it starts breaking down. Because GraphQL edge caching actually has different constraints. And the main constraint that is different is that one server serves many users, but one client only serves one user. And so GraphQL clients can make a bunch of assumptions around authorization because they know if something is in the cache, the user that fetches a new query can access anything that's in the cache because it's always the same user. But if you're a GraphQL edge cache, right, and you have, this, you have a bunch of stuff stored in your, in your cache, you got to figure out which user can access what data because it's fundamentally just multiple users fetching from the same cache, which is very different. The other thing that's very different is that it's a globe that you need global invalidation, right? It's not just one location. If you have an edge cache on a CDN running in many locations worldwide, suddenly when data changes, you gotta invalidate it in all of these locations everywhere, rather than just on your one browser. And that has, adds an extra level of complexity, of course, because as we all know, distributed systems really scary. They're kind of hard. Um, and that's really what we do at GraphCDN. 
we took the philosophical ideas of GraphQL clients, but made them work as a GraphQL edge cache. And so the way this works is that GraphCDN is a gateway that sits in between your GraphQL client and your GraphQL API. And so it's essentially a proxy where you, instead of sending the queries directly to your API, you first go through our gateway and we do all of the caching for you. Now, we did not want to build a CDN. That's a super hard problem, and the infrastructure for that is very complex to build. And so instead, we used Fastly's computed edge product, um, which is very ple pleasant because that means we have 60 locations pretty much everywhere around the globe, even though my uh, you can imagine a map behind this. I don't know why that isn't showing up. It's showing up interestingly on my preview, not showing up on the screen, but you can imagine a map, right? We have locations everywhere. I promise it's a world map, right? It, it's everywhere, uh, which was very nice. Um, and really, the main thing I want to show you is a live demo, which is very scary because this might totally break. Okay, so if this breaks, bear with me. Okay, I'm going to try to give a live demo of what um, GraphCDN actually looks like. So if I could see where the hell I am, uh, let me make my browser a little bit smaller. Uh, I'm going to go to graphcdn.io dashboard, MXSTBR, and I'm going to create, uh, actually, no, let me go to onboarding, because then we can create a service for the GitHub GraphQL API, uh, because uh, that is very nice. It's a very nice GraphQL API. In case you haven't used GitHub's GraphQL API, it's massive. We could not introspect the GraphQL API. Oh, we could. Just took a while. That's a, if, you ha, if you ever looked at the GitHub GraphQL API introspection result, it's insanely big. What's interesting is actually, I used to work at GitHub a long time ago, it's a complete side note, but they have three different GraphQL APIs. They have a GraphQL API that they expose to the external world, then they have a GraphQL API that they expose internally, which contains even more stuff, and then they have a second internal GraphQL API that also has a bunch of admin stuff. And that GraphQL API is so big that most tools crash because it literally has tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of types. It is so big you cannot look at it. It's completely insane. Uh, anyways, uh, we can, we're, we're now going to create a GraphCDN service for the GitHub GraphQL API. Obviously, it's a demo name because uh, uh, I doubt GitHub is going to use this, although they could. Um, this takes a while because, of course, we have to spin up all the infrastructure in the 60 locations everywhere. And then we get a um, GraphCDN service. And so what I can fetch here, for example, is a topic from GitHub. I'm going to fetch the GraphQL topic because, of course, that's really cool. And when I fetch that, that sort of doesn't work because it requires authentication. Oh, no. It's completely broken. Thankfully, I have a fallback because I am prepared. Um, this is why live demos are really scary. I hope I can remember this. Let's try this. Let's try this again. Uh, so we have another service <laughs> that also works with the GitHub GraphQL API. And when I run a query here that fetches a repository, I'm going to do a repository of mine. Let's do Urkel exchange. Have I mentioned that Urkel is awesome yet? I, I don't know if I've said this often enough. Um, I'm going to fetch the ID, maybe name with owner, and stargazer count, just for fun. And hopefully this works, and I get a repository back. Now, this took about 230, 40 milliseconds and was a cache miss. So this query was, went through our gateway, was passed through to the GitHub GraphQL API, came back with the result, and we passed it back to this client right here. Now, when I fetch this query again, we'll have it put in our cache and actually it'll come back in way faster because it's a cache hit. And so our gateway realized that I'm the same user. I have sent the exact same query. And so obviously, I can serve the same result. right? And this is now cached. In this case, the max age is set to 900 seconds, which you can configure, of course. And I can run this as many times as I want, and it'll always be served from the cache. And it'll always be super fast. Doesn't matter. right? And your origin just saw one query, but your users might be sending dozens or hundreds even which is cool, but it gets even cooler. Because if I now run a mutation, um, actually, let me also fetch the description here, uh, because let's edit that with a mutation. So we're also going to fetch the description. Again, that has to go back to the origin, because we haven't had the description before. Now we have it. Now it's cached uh, and super fast. And so what we're going to do is we're going to change the description. Um, we're going to do a mutation that is edit repository. No, update repository. Uh, and we're going to pass some input to that including the repository ID. And the repository ID I have to get from the here, of course, because otherwise it's really hard to look backwards and copy and paste stuff. I just now realized, oops, <laughs> I have no idea what just happened. Particularly because, did I select everything? 
Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Pair programming. Okay. <laughs> or more like crowd programming. Uh, and then we're going to change the description to say, hey, Berlin. And then we're going to we have to fetch some stuff, of course. So we're going to do ID, uh, sorry, repository, ID name with owner. And let's also fetch the description to check that it actually changed. Uh, now, this is actually running against the production GraphQL API. So if you go to that repository afterwards, it'll say, hey, Berlin. Uh, so we've now updated this repository. Uh, and we can verify that very, very quickly in the, by going to the query and running that query again. And what we see is that the description is updated to Hey Berlin and that this was a cache miss. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> My co founder, everybody. Uh, thank you for applauding. Uh, what, what's actually really cool here is that we saw the mutation and we invalidated this cache query result, but we did that globally. So even if another user would have fetched the same repository in India or in the US or in Africa or in South America, they would also be getting the new result by now. In fact, we can invalidate cached query results globally in 150 milliseconds. So in 150 milliseconds after a mutation passes through our system, the any cached query result that contains that stale data will be, will be removed from our cache, which is mind blowing to me because that's almost as fast as the speed of light. Thankfully, we only have to go halfway around the planet because we go both ways, right? Uh, <laughs> so it's not quite as fast as speed of light, but very, 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 very fast. Um, and of course, now it's cached again. And so when I run this again, it lets the same thing. And just to prove that I actually ran this against the production graph, uh, GitHub GraphQL API, I'm going to try opening this repository. And it's going to say, hey, Berlin, in the description. Can you indeed the description already? Uh, yes. But then, of course, it wouldn't be updated because it didn't pass through our gateway. And our gateway wouldn't know about it. Um, What's also interesting is that you can manually invalidate things. So if I were to update the description here and say, hey, Berlin, this is new. Now, of course, the cache query result wouldn't know anything about this change because it didn't pass through our gateway. Normally, if your application uses GraphCDN, it would see the mutation again and invalidate automatically. But you can also go, we expose sort of a manual purging API for exactly these use cases, like the list invalidation use case. And you can write these kinds of mutations here where you can say mutation uh, purge repository. And then I can purge any cache query result that contains a certain repository by ID. And so when I run this, it's going to take 150 milliseconds. And then any cache query result that contains this repository will also be purged globally, which is super useful for, for example, the list invalidation edge case that we were talking about. And when I go back here now and fetch this again, it'll have this is new in the schema. All right, that was a live demo, which went semi well. And that's really all I have for you today. Uh, the last thing I will say, thank you for having me, come get some stickers. Uh, Marco, Phil, Sue, and Tim all have stickers, and I also have stickers. This is the first uh, production run we've ever done of GraphCDN stickers, so you're getting first edition stickers, uh, which you can always be proud of forever. So come find us, get some stickers, and thank you for having me. Questions? Remember to yeah, at least this. Anyone. Of course. There you go. Yeah, I actually do it much. So, um, given that most of the services that you might use already have like the CDN in their bed, and we would want to stitch them together on the edge, is that something you were at least considering or already doing, maybe even? Because um, the problem I usually had with that was that when you stitch something together, you're basically building your own server in front of it. So, you're basically not using all the CDN functionality. All the engineers are hard working on in like GitHub, Shopify, Contentful, whatever. Yeah, that's a great question, actually. Um, we've seen a lot of our customers putting us in front of their Apollo federated services already. Um, so we have a lot of customers who put us in front of their unified federated graph, which makes a ton of sense, right? Because you want to cache your GraphQL API. We don't currently do Apollo Federation ourselves, but of course, being at the edge would be a very ideal location to do something like that, because it would be a lot faster than having a central server again um, that might crash. So we'll see what happens there. But we do support it right now already. Uh, you can just put us in front of your federated graph, and we'll cache everything all around the world. Great question. Yes. Let's see if I can throw that quickly. Yeah. Uh, what about the queries that have some search inside? Because where, personally, I fail with caching, it's where you just search with just, I, I want all the posts that have just a foo inside. I search, cool, and somebody add a post with foo on its cache. So it will never just pop up on the result. 
Exactly. That's where the manual invalidation comes in, right? So in your use case, you would say, okay, hey, in the, after the create post mutation, you would ping our API and be like, hey, please purge the query.search query or any cache query result that is search. And so that way, you would tell us basically that that list has changed, right? It's the same problem. Again, you have a list of posts, right? Whether that's a search or that comes from a post query, it's always the same problem. As soon as you create a new item, you can't know which stuff has changed. And so you need to manually invalidate that. And that's why we have this sort of purge API, because of course there's use cases like that where you need to manually invalidate stuff. Perfect. Perfect. Any other questions that I can answer? Perfect. Thanks for having me, folks.